you have a mass M that goes around in circle with a given speed <coughs> just to make it simple let's make that speed constant um, the kinetic energy of this rotating mass is half m mass times speed square but we can also say based on the fact that since the motion is circular and uniform that the speed is equal to omega and omega is the angular velocity times r so we can plug this quantity in our kinetic energy equation and then we have the kinetic energy now written as half m omega square r square. <coughs> so we can rearrange these terms this way. And we can define a quantity i moment of inertia given by the product of mass times distance to the center of rotation to the square and kinetic energy of a rotating body can be written as half moment of inertia times omega square now in, in physics 2a we don't expand and we don't demonstrate what would be the kinetic energy not of a rotating mass but the kinetic energy of a rotating disk imagine you don't have a mass but you, you have a disk like a coin that is rotating around a center of rotation so if you imagine this uh, coin divided in several, several little pieces of masses, right? Each one of them rotating with their own uh, speed. And again, the speed of these uh, little masses will depend on where they are in respect to the center of rotation. We can determine and we can uh, use, in fact, calculus to demonstrate the kinetic energy of a rotating disk is half i moment of inertia of this disk that we don't calculate in physics 2a times omega square every single mass will have the same omega so the question then lies in determining the moment of inertia so in other words any rotating body it could be a disk could be a sphere could be a dumbbell anything that rotates its kinetic energy is given by this expression okay half moment of inertia times the square of its angular velocity so this is very powerful because we can apply this information to calculate all kind of things like if you have a sphere that um, goes down if you have a sphere that goes down a slope of a given angle right so you have a sphere going down uh, and that sphere has a mass m so we can divide this kinetic motion we can divide um, this this slowing down motion in two components one component is the one given by a mass m that goes down this slope itself and the kinetic energy of this mass is half m times the velocity square of its center of mass i mean you can you can see a car running with a certain velocity and the car will have uh, a speed uh, you can read the speed in the speedometer right so the kinetic energy is half mv squared 
But in addition to this translational motion, uh, the wheels of the car also rotate. In my example of a ball that rolls down the slope, the ball has its translational kinetic energy, but also has rotation. The ball rotates as it as it uh, um, goes down, unless it's slipping. So pretend it's not slipping. So in this case, the total kinetic energy of this rotating body body will be given by the kinetic energy of uh, the rotating sphere plus the kinetic energy that exists by the simple fact the sphere rotates, right? So you have one component that is just the translational motion and you have a second component that is given by rotation. And so the total kinetic energy of this rotating system, rotating and moving system is given by half m v square plus half moment of inertia of, in my example, a sphere times uh, omega square. And certainly uh, both v, the speed, can be related to the omega, the angular velocity, by the expression v is equal omega r, where r is the radius of my sphere. Now, in your book, um, there is a table that provides moment of inertia of several uh, different types of bodies, uh, of a cylinder, or, so we have a cylinder, another body is a disc, or you have a disc that is hollow, you have a sphere, a sphere that is hollow. So each object has its own moment of inertia, and you should use uh, those formulas in order to uh, solve the problems. Okay. Another uh, aspect of this theory that I would like to emphasize is the relation between torque, moment, moment of inertia, and quantities related to to rotation, such as omega which is angular velocity, alpha, which is angular acceleration, um, which we studied in, in previous chapter. So, as an example, let's take, for instance, uh, the situation, as we had before, of a mass M that rotates with a certain speed and <coughs> and this mass is rotating because it has a string connected to it. Can you figure? Can you picture that? And this spring has a tension. Okay. So if this is the only situation happening, um, what is the torque of forces that happen to be existing in this situation with respect to the center of rotation? Well. As we studied before, um, if if the mass m just make it uh, the problem kind of uh, treatable here. Imagine this is happening as the string connects to a mass that goes around a table, around a table with a constant velocity, meaning there is no friction acting on it. Your mass has also a weight has a weight, and because it's sitting on a table, it has a normal force, has a normal force acting on it, right? And these two forces, the weight and normal force, cancels out, and you are left only with the tension force that is the one uh, providing the centripetal acceleration to the system. So when you ask what is the net torque Remember, we study in class the conditions of equilibrium in a system is the one in which the net torque, the total torque of all forces, must be zero. So the net torque in this situation is zero if the speed is constant. If the speed is constant, 
it means the net force of this ball sitting on a table that goes with a constant speed around center of rotation is such that normal cancels with gravity the only force acting is tension so the torque is zero because tension times uh, the lever arm in this case that's zero remember the force is passing through the center of rotation so zero times the tension force then then we have a torque that is that is zero there is no um, there is no torque in in this system now let's change a little bit the problem and 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 just for consideration the sake of consideration let's pretend there is a force now that is pulling let me put in this force with a different color there is a force now that is pulling the mass forward so imagine this new force is is like a motor right it's like a motor so this motor is um, is giving um, momentum to this mass so the speed of the mass changes all the time now what is the net torque in this system now well the net torque the new torque is the torque of all forces torque torque of all forces that happen to be acting on the systems and we saw that in this case the torque of the normal force is equal to the torque of the weight of that little mass and is equal to the torque of tension force they are all zero except the torque of this new force F what is the torque of new force F well the torque is given by uh, the product of the force itself by the lever arm let me write this um, or let's draw this uh, circle with a different perspective this is the force F that happens to be act on a mass M right here right the force F acti acting on a mass M and and the radius is here given so the torque is given by the product of the force times the lever arm r times force okay but according to newton's law the force is proportional to the acceleration the linear acceleration of that body in linear acceleration m a and we also studied so the total torque is the torque of force F and we studied that <coughs> acceleration the linear acceleration is equal to alpha R so there are three basic equations relating angular to linear acceleration like uh, if you have a circle and if you have an angle theta and this is an arc s s is equal theta times the radius and the linear speed is equal to the angular acceleration times r and the linear acceleration is equal to angular acceleration times r so what i did here what i did here was replacing the linear acceleration by angular acceleration which means the torque total torque which is the torque of all these one two three forces acting on the mass is in fact given by r times m times alpha times r and i will rewrite this this way but what is m r squared m i square as we saw in the previous uh, uh, slide or the previous whiteboard is moment of inertia so which means in a rotating body at least in this type of example of a rotating mass the total torque is equal to moment of inertia of that object times the angular acceleration so this is a 
very important and crucial equation that will help us to solve all kind of problems involving uh, motion that has acceleration. Okay, and that is the torque of all forces acting on a body and responsible for giving that body rotation is equal to the moment of inertia of that body times the angular acceleration that body has. Okay. So let's see how this play out in in a in a problem. Uh, this is uh, the problems. Uh, this the, the the handout I gave in class problem number eight. It goes it goes like this: a potter wheels having a radius of uh, 0.45 meters and moment of inertia of four, 14 kilograms meters square is rotating freely with some omega. So we have to be able to we have to have now the ability of reading this information and converting. Uh, to proper quantities. Revolution per minute is the unity of angular velocity. So it's being given angular velocity with the unities of revolution per minute. And since we are um, using international system unities, you have to be able to convert that to omega, uh, unities of omega, uh, which is radians per second. So the potter can stop the wheel in 8 seconds by pressing a wet rag against the rim, kind of a brake system, and exerting a radially inward force of 72 newtons. Find the effective coefficient of kinetic friction between the wheel and the wet rag. So let's uh, see how this problem goes, play out. Okay, let me, uh, let me pull the information here. So we have a wheel, a disc, right, that is rotating, is rotating, and it rotates initially with 52 revolutions per minute. So again, we have to remember that revolution per minute must be converted to radians per second. So how we do that? Um, I, 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 I'm doing down here but let's let's first put out all the given information so the radius is given so we have the radius there right the radius is given uh, r is 0.45 minutes meters so r 0.45 meters okay good now <clears throat> the moment of inertia is given so I, uh, which is good. We don't need to calculate that. We don't need to go to the table. Moment of inertia is already given. So I is 14 kilograms meter square. So it's already given. Okay. And um, it says that once you take, for instance, a dump cloth, and then you press against the rotating wheel, it's like a brake, right? So you press against uh, with a force of 72 newtons, right? Here's another way of saying, you press with that force of 72 newtons, the wheel stops. Why is that? Well, because once you stop, there will be a friction exerted by the contact between the damped clot, clot with the, the wheel itself. So the wheel is rotating in this direction down here, so going down. Therefore, the frictional force is the one against the direction of motion. It should be, in fact, perpendicular to that. So it's kind of the problems we did before of normal force in a block that moves in a horizontal surface and you have a normal force exert on it. And the friction force, in this case, is kinetic. You have motion. So the friction force is equal to a coefficient of kinetic friction times the force um, that is being uh, exerted in producing this friction, in this case, it is 72 newtons. Right, oh, I, don't know. Oh, I did something funny here with my stylus. 72 newtons. So you want to find this quantity here. We want to find 
find the effective coefficient of kinetic friction. Coefficient of kinetic friction is this baby down here. Okay, so this is what our task. So how how do we solve for that? Well, um, first remember this handy dandy equation that I mentioned. Torque, the torque of all forces acting, external forces acting on a system that rotates is equal to the moment of inertia of that system times uh, the angular acceleration. Okay, so which forces are acting and doing torque? It's not this external force, because these external forces act radial to the wheel. So radial means um, its direction, its line of action passes through the center of rotation, right? And therefore, the torque of this external 72 newtons force is zero, right? So the only force effectively doing any torque is the force of friction. So fr frictional force times the radius, frictional force times the radius is equal to moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. So what I'm doing is pretty much applying that handy dandy equation that relates torque to angular acceleration by introducing and replacing the symbol of torque by the force that are responsible for torque, which is friction. So friction times radius is equal moment of inertia times uh, alpha. Now look at this. Moment of inertia is given 40 kilometers, uh, kilograms per meter square. Uh, the radius I have, the radius I have is 0.45 meters. Uh, the frictional force I know is equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction times the force uh, perpendicular to the surface, the normal, in this case is my F, 72. So, and I want to find this, so that's good. I can place my um, unknown coefficient of kinetic friction here. I can replace um, by the uh, R by the radius. Moment of inertia given is given, but how can I solve for um, angular acceleration? Well, we have to remember the equations of motion of a rotating body. And one of these, there are three, remember. One is theta is equal to theta initial plus initial angular velocity times t plus half angular acceleration times square. Another one is omega is omega initial plus alpha t. And the other one is uh, Bernoulli variation of this equation, okay? So, this second equation is the good one to be used, and that's what I would do. The final omega is equal to initial omega times alpha t. What is the final omega? Is zero radians per second, because the wheel stops. And the initial omega is given right here, 52 revolutions per minute, which I have converted to uh, radians per second. And the time is given, eight seconds. That's how long it takes for that wheel to stop. So once I plug the numbers here, I find my uh, angular acceleration, which is should be a negative value, right? So then, but it's a number. So I take this number, plug it in here. This is given, this is given. And this is uh, the quantity needed to calculate my coefficient of kinetic friction. And then the problem is solved. So it, it's a long problem. It has several steps, but the important part is the use of this expression here. Okay. Let's take a look at our uh, uh, last problem in this uh, handout. Oh, no, I have more is an Atwood machine that consists of a pulley with two masses, M1 and M2, and, 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 and the, these two masses are different, meaning 
this uh, system will be such that uh, the most massive component will pull the other one up and of course obviously it's going to go down. So let's read the problem. This machine consists of blocks of 13 kilograms and 23 kilograms attached by a cord that runs over a pulley. The pulley is a solid cylinder, the mass is given, rage is given, and the block of mass M2 is allowed to drop, and the cord turns the pulley without slipping. So in this problem, uh, all the problems we have done so far that involves pulley, the tension that goes around the pulley um, doesn't change, is the same in, the, in this case. When the pulley is massless, and there is no friction associated with the pulley motion, the tension uh, in one side of the pulley is the same tension in the other side. We have done this problem before several times. But now the pulleys, the cylinders, the rotating body have mass. They are not massless. They are considered to have mass, which means they will, dry, they will drain energy out of your system, which means um, you must have an unbalanced torque on it responsible for providing uh, angular acceleration on it. Okay? So let's see how, how we, we face this type of problem here. Let's write down the given information. So This is mass M2, this is mass M1, right? Now, when we write the forces that happen to be acting on the pulley itself, so of course the pulley is suspended somehow, but both M1 and M2 exert a downward force on the pulley. So at the pulley level, which means if we want to just look at forces acting on the pulley, those are the two forces, tension 1 and tension 2, downward and downward. Um, in fact, my representation here is not ideal. The reason is the tension number 2 should be bigger than the tension number 1, right? Why? Well, because M2 is bigger. It should be something like that. Okay, so and I don't need this mass right here. Okay, all right. So M1, M2, M2, 23 kilograms. That's why the tension is bigger, right? So we have an imbalance forces, and that thing is going to fall down. So how can we treat this problem? Um, so using the dynamics of motion. So put aside that somehow in solving this problem. We are going to use this torque of all forces responsible for giving rotation in the system is equal to the moment of inertia of that system times angular acceleration alpha. This is a crucial, uh, handy dandy, all stars type of equation. Okay. So, and how do we find the acceleration of the system? How do we get acceleration? Well, if you want to tackle acceleration, um, you, you look, for instance, at mass M2, the one that is falling right here, right? So we have a mass M2 in there. So what are the forces that are acting on mass M2? Well, I have a tension, a downward tension, and I'm, I'm sorry. Jeez, what am I doing? I have a downward weight. I have a downward gravity, which is given by its mass times g. But I have a cord that is holding on to that. So the tension force on the cord is the reaction to this tension force that we 
applied on the pulley. So it's the pair action reaction we learned in Newton's third law of motion. Uh, the value of this tension is the same as this one, but it's opposite direction. So if you apply the laws of motion in this following, ma following, following mass, uh, we have M2G minus tension is equal its mass times acceleration. Okay? Good enough? So we can take the tension and make it so that you write it as function of mass and acceleration. So then we have an equation here to think about it. That's our equation number one. But see, I don't have A and I don't have T2. So one equation, two unknowns, can solve. Now that, let's look at mass now in one. If you look at mass in one and you do a free body diagram on it, what are the forces on it? Well, I have the weight of this mass, right? I have the weight pulling down, given by m1 times g. But I also have the tension of the cord that is pulling this mass up. Again, m2 is bigger than m1, which means the system falls this way, and as m2 falls down, m1 moves up. Okay? So, when you apply the laws of motion, in this case, the magnitude of acceleration of block M1, the magnitude is the same as that of block M2. They are connected by the same string. And when you apply the laws of motion in this upward uh, mass M1 motion, we write T2 minus I'm sorry, it's not T2, it's T1. What am I doing? T1. Same thing here. T1 minus N1G is equal M1A. This is Newton's second law of motion. So I can write T1 as a function of M1 and acceleration. So I get myself a second equation. See? Second equation. Now, <coughs> this is complicated because I have two equations and how many unknowns? I have one unknown, two unknowns, and three unknowns. T1, T2, and A. I can't solve a system of three unknowns with two equations only. So I need something else. And what exactly do I need? I need this handy dandy equation because so far I have not included the flu yet into the system. So let's bring this third equation, torque is equal moment of inertia times alpha into consideration. What's the first thing we have to realize? The acceleration of these blocks, the magnitude of it, these falling masses or upward masses, the same as the linear acceleration at the rim of this wheel. So the acceleration of the cord here, that's the linear acceleration, or the tangent acceleration, is equal to, or is related to, the angular acceleration by the following expression. A is equal alpha r. Okay. That is cool. The second thing is, what are the forces that are giving up some torque on this wheel? Well, the forces T2 and T1. The two T2 tor force gives a torque that is counterclockwise. Uh, I'm sorry, clockwise. So the wheel rotates clockwise. And the T1 gives a torque that is counterclockwise. So the acceleration is going to be such that, remember our definition, T2 clockwise 
negative of I'm, I'm sorry the torque the torque of force 2 is equal to the force itself times the radius and the torque 1 which is counterclockwise is equal to T1 times R so if we add those two equations um, T1 minus T2 times R so this is the total torque this is the total torque this is equal to alpha moment of inertia times alpha which is equal to uh, if you look at this equation alpha is equal a over r a over r and here is our third equation <coughs> our third equation relates t1 t2 r which is given and moment of inertia and acceleration so we have three equations and three unknowns to solve so what is the moment of inertia you go to your book let's try to find it in in the book so you have to go to the book uh, sorry let me put a pause for it so in your book in the page 257 you have examples of bodies in which the moment of inertia is given so for a cylinder or a disk the equation of a moment of inertia is half m r square r is the radio radius of your cylinder so going back to um, so going back to our problem so the moment of inertia of this cylinder is half m r square and then the problem can can be solved because uh, what we have is t1 minus t2 out of equation number 3 that multiplies r is equal half m r square times a over r r cancels out r cancels out and that gives us give us t1 minus t2 is equal half m a okay now how can we get out of this I let's say if you take equation number two and subtract from equation number one right then we have t1 minus t2 is equal m1g minus m2g which is a number plus m1a minus m2a that relies on a and this is equal half mass of the pool of time a according to this equation so if I subtract equation number two equation number one I can solve for a the acceleration and once I have acceleration I can find the tension and I can find tension one and tension two okay and the last problem I would like to comment is number 12 we have a solid uniform disk the radius is given the mass is given rolls down a ramp the length is given and makes an angle of 18 degrees with the horizontal find the speed of the disk center of mass when it reaches the bottom of the ramp and find the angular speed of the disk at the bottom of the ramp so this is a problem that we can solve using uh, the dynamics of motion as we have learned but we can also use conservation of energy 
so I will use the two approaches any approach any approach is basically good any approach we will we'll do it um, let's take the first approach and that is you have a ramp in fact let me So this ramp has an angle of 18 degrees, right? And the disc is going down. This is the center of mass of the disc. The mass is given 58.6 kilograms. The length of this ramp is also given 5.20 meters. angle 18 degrees and the disc is start from rest at the top of the, the ramp find the speed of the disc down there so first thing to do is to bring all forces that happen to be acting on this disc uh, we have the weight of it we have the normal force and we have a uh, static friction It's not kinetic friction, it's static, because the point of contact between the disc and the ramp is such that it's not slipping. If it slipped, it would be kinetic, but it's not moving with respect to um, uh, the, the incline surface. And because it doesn't move, it provides uh, a rotational torque given by Fs, um, the static friction uh, então, uh, then um, so is so when when you when you use when you uh, when you use when you use the laws of motion to solve for this problem, um, and, and, and again, what is, what is being asked? We want to find, uh, in this case, what is the speed of the disk as it arrives to the bottom part. So basically, you have some object moving. So altogether, this object has some acceleration, right? has some acceleration and 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 what are the forces acting on this body so I have the frictional force right here I have the weight and I have the normal force I have three forces on it so what we learn in Newton's law of motion sum of all forces equal mass of the body oh let me use the proper symbol is equal to mass of the body times acceleration okay that's the first thing that comes to our mind the other thing is there is a length upon which this body moves and we know the initial speed the speed the body the the the, the mass is released is zero meters per second and what we want to find is the final speed what is the final speed of this rolling uh, block we don't know but we know the equations of motion final velocity is equal initial velocity plus at I, 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 I mean if I knew I have the initial I have I, I want to find the final but I don't have the acceleration and the time I don't know um, another equation of motion that might come handy is final velocity square initial velocity square 
plus 2 times acceleration times the length in which this system got to be moving and I have that is 5.20 meters so if I happen to know acceleration since I know L since I know initial velocity which is zero I can solve for the final speed so let's try to determine the acceleration using the laws of motion so which equations we have to consider one is I have a rotating body I have a disk that rolls down the ramp which means somehow I have to use this handy dandy equation to torque of all forces that happen to be responsible for the rotating cylinder is equal to moment of inertia of that cylinder times the angular acceleration of it okay and I also know that the linear acceleration is equal to angular acceleration times the radius so I, I have to uh, play my cards and use that properly since I want to solve for linear acceleration I'm going to write this equation here in a different way torque is equal moment of inertia times angular acceleration which is a over r and since my cylinder has a tabulated moment of inertia I will use that expression right half mr square which we can take out of the book times a over r cancel cancel then I have this handy then the equation torque is equal half m r times a okay okay very good now let's now use Newton's law of motion sum of all forces is equal ma so what is the direction of motion is the direction along which I have my acceleration pointed so when you when you do a little uh, projection of forces we find this angle 18 degrees is right here why well because this is a right angle this is 90 minus 18 but since this angle is um, 90 degrees then I have my 18 in there so sum of forces sum of forces in in this axis if you call this x axis sum of forces in x axis is equal m a but which forces are projected in x not normal normal is zero normal doesn't project in x but gravity and the frictional force do so gravity or the weight mg times sine of 18 minus frictional force is equal ma there you go so that um, F friction is equal m g sine 18 minus m a so I have a, a frictional static force that is given by uh, by this expression that involve a quantity I don't know and I want to find by the way which is acceleration now remember this equation torque is equal I times moment uh, uh, angular acceleration so which force are torquing this wheel which forces are responsible for uh, rotating the wheel it's the frictional force only gravity doesn't normal doesn't because they act on the center of rotation so static friction times R is equal to the torque and we just found the torque is half m r a so 
when you cancel and you cancel then uh, then the static friction is equal to half m a so what do we do next well we solve the problem we take this quantity plug it in here then we can solve for a once we have a once we have a we plug it in here and then we can find our speed okay that's how we solve this problem using the dynamics of motion another way of solving the problem is if Um, use conservation of energy. I was trying to see if I can open another page here. Um, so to use conservation of energy, how do we do that? It's the same situation. 18 degrees. We have a cylinder going down. This is your point A, point B. How can we use conservation of energy to find the speed? What do we do? Well, problems involving conservation of energy, we go down the list of energy we have available. Do we have kinetic energy at point A? No. Do we have kinetic energy at point B when the wheel gets to that point? Yes. We have translational kinetic energy got given by half mv squared but we also have the rotational kinetic energy we just learned in the previous slide given by half i omega squared remember it's a rotating uh, cylinder but we can write omega as v over r which means we can write this quantity here as V square divided by omega. I'm sorry. Divided by R square. Where do I have my head today? I can't tell you. There you go. So at point, this is a point A. And point B, kinetic energy. Um, how about potential energy? Do we have gravitational potential energy? Well, at point A I do. And that is given by m g times the vertical displacement d or h and the vertical displacement is l sine of 80 and what is the gravitational potential energy at point b zero see the other problem we did so many steps but this problem we can solve in a very simple and elegant A. M G L sine 18, which is the total energy that is stored at point A, is equal to the total energy of the system at point B, and that depends on um, depends on one only single equation that can gives you the speed right away see that because we have m in fact m is going to cancel out once you replace moment of inertia by this expression right and then you have you're going to cancel that out good enough all right uh email me if you have more questions regarding this chapter um and uh, and I will give you the a lab break this week, so on report. So no need of a lab report this week. See you Monday.